right. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Ryan. I'm an account manager with My Strategic Plan. Uh, the purpose of this call is to strategy huddle, as a number of you know, but the, what we do here. But the, uh, we're going to talk strategy. We're going to talk execution and address the real world questions and provide some ideas. And real, really, the goal is to give you some actionable solutions the way you're looking for to move forward. Um, so quick ground rules. The presentation will be 45 to 60 minutes. Uh, we're just running, going back on the slide, switching computers here. Um, we encourage participation. If you identify with yourself with a topic or a question or have some insight that you'd like to share, on the right-hand side in the WebEx box, um, you're going to just scroll over that gray box, either gray or green, depending upon your screen setup, and scroll over and you'll see a chat uh, icon. Typically, it's the, the, the second from the right. Go ahead and click on there and send a chat, and we will get back uh, get back to you on that with any questions. And it's important to know that this is not a rehearsed presentation. Obviously, you can tell so far it's not rehearsed. So uh, we're just going to keep going. Uh, we received a number of questions from participants the past few weeks. Unfortunately, we're only going to be addressing two of them today. But every month, our goal is to address two or three questions that you as participants are, are submitting. So for next month, go ahead and, and submit a question. We'll give you some information on the back side of this presentation to do so. Uh, I'm going to take a minute just to introduce today's strategy huddle leaders, and that's going to be Erica and Tammy. One of our team members that you're familiar with on the strategy huddle is Howard, and he's out today traveling on business. So again, today's leaders will be Erica and Tammy. Erica is the co-founder of M3 Planning, which is the parent company of My Strategic Plan, and is really the brains behind the intellectual property of the system. She is the VP of Marketing, the author of the My Strategic Plan for Dummies, and has several spot videos uh, on both My Strategic Plan as well as YouTube. Tammy is a senior account manager on a professional side of our business and has a strong focus on research. Really, the Net Promoter Scorecard is uh, something she does very well for us and uh, she's in charge of. And she's also uh, working with a lot of our customers and executing their plans. And one thing she'll be covering today is, for example, is the strategy reviews. Finally, we're excited to have for our first, our first visiting strategy leader, and that is Daryl Vanderwilt. Daryl is the project director of the Strength in the Row Iowa, where they are providing capacity building assistance to selected nonprofits. Currently, that means 17, and in the near future, they're adding a, an additional 14. So he has his hands full, and he's going to share with us some great insights, and I look forward to uh, hearing from him later in this hour. With that said, I will turn the call over to Erica, and we're going to get this started. Great. Thanks, Brian, for that introduction. And um, I just would ask if anybody cannot see our screen, if you could please just pop a chat in the chat box, that would be great. Um, and we'll uh, address that as we're as, as quickly as we possibly can. Just a little bit of information about us. I just threw that up while Ryan was uh, chatting um, to really say that what we try to do as an organization is provide practical applications to best practices and strategy and execution. That's really what we're all about. So some of the information um, that we'll be sharing today may uh, may be really well known to you and some of it may not be. And we really hope to try to address um, all levels and understanding of um, strategy and execution so you can make the biggest impact in your organization um, and in your community and, and um, in your business. So that's really, really what we're all about. Quick agenda. Uh, we're going to, we always just do a strategy stat of the month, just quickly run through that. We had a question about the balance scorecard and, um, you know, in true form and fashion, this particular topic as well as the strategy review topic, um, we could spend a whole hour, if not a whole day on. So we're, of course, going to take about 20 minutes for each of those questions and touch some of the high points. Um, mentioned that Dara will be uh, presenting as our visiting strategy leader and then Time permitting, um, I, we like to say tapping into the wisdom of the crowd. We'd love to um, address any questions that you might have um, that we can um, all ho hopefully chime in on. And if we don't get to that, uh, we'll take your questions that you'd like to see addressed and we'll bring them forward to the next strategy huddle. So again, as Ryan reiterated, uh, please use the chat box on the on the right hand side. All right, let's let's jump right on in. Just a quick little strategy stat. We just like to bring you some of these ideas. Um, this is from McKinsey again. On, um, on surveys of what other people are thinking, you may be seeing this in your organization, you may not be, but you know, what's the, 
What's the role of government? Um, how do you expect the government's involvement in your industry to change in the next three to five years? And I know, especially with this quite um, heated healthcare debate right now, this is sort of an interesting uh, stat to throw out, but we thought it kind of fun. So, at any rate, what's important about this, I think, is maybe this is something you're seeing, and, and how does that play forward into your strategic plan over the next several years? Uh, maybe it's something that you're not seeing, and maybe it's something you want to put in the back of your mind to ask yourself. Um, um, how might the government uh, be influencing uh, your industry, and what might we need to, what might what, what might we need to be thinking about um, as it relates to that, as it relates to our strategic direction um, as an organization? So, an interesting article that I just read uh, a couple of days ago, and you all might be experiencing this as well, is um, some concerns with um, state governments um, defaulting. Um, and we know that, you know, California certainly was sort of an, in an interesting situation, and there were some other states uh, that might uh, not be in such a great situation as well. So that's a different side of a risk management as it relates to uh, the role of government if you do a lot of government work. So uh, just some stuff to think about there. All right, moving on to our first strategy topic is what is Bell Scorecard and why use it? And, again, you know, just being really mindful about uh, the fact that there's a lot of information about balance scorecards, there's tons of books written about it. I wanted to present some information about how uh, we like to talk about it, um, and you might find it useful if you need to be communicating on um, using the balance scorecard in your organization. So that's really um, kind of twofold. One is, is if it's new to you, um, great information. It's something that you're really well versed in. Um, this might be some interesting information for you to take back to uh, your team to communicate it more broadly within your organization. And then the last point about this I'd like to say as well is I think, you know, the balance scorecard comes with a lot of different um, connotations and understanding, and we, you know, believe that the balance scorecard approach is integral to an effective strategic plan, and, and breaking it apart and really just you know, working through different pieces of it uh, will make it an effective tool um, in your strategy and execution. So, um, so let's look at this. Let's and let's let's answer this question. This was a question um, that we had submitted a couple of months ago, and then also had um, several different clients ask for further explanation about the balance scorecard too. So, that's why uh, we wanted to address this today. Uh, in the spirit, of course, of the strategy huddle, um, our goal is to get your feedback on what's working for you. So if you have an example uh, or some examples, or, you know, one example of a, the balance scorecard working in your organization, uh, we'd love to share it at the end of this little segment of mine. So um, something just I wanted to start that question. We're going to come back to it after I go through um, after I go through the information. So if you've got some examples of how you put the balance scorecard to use in your organization, please um, please add them to the chat box, and we'll take them at the end of this section. All right, so let's break it down. Uh, let's first look at the balance part of the balanced scorecard. So as a little, as a little uh, breakdown, an interactive breakdown of how this works, the balance part of the, part of the balance scorecard breaks down into four perspectives of what organizations need to be strategic. And it starts with the people and learning perspective. Again, these perspectives come in different shapes and forms, but this is just the standard generic uh, balance part of the balance scorecard. People and learning um, is the foundation and the core of any organization. And when, when we have the right people, as we know, doing the right stuff with the right training and the right culture uh, behind it, we're able to drive the internal processes um, that we need in order to create our products and services. Those internal processes look like operational processes, technology processes, marketing and sales processes, financial processes, innovation processes. And those processes that we need to excel at drive our customer value creation or our customer value proposition. So it helps us acquire new customers, it helps us keep our current customers, and of course it helps us service uh, those customers that we have. And you know, a couple of these things go in different places depending upon the type of strategy map that you're looking at or the balance uh, scorecard that you're looking at. But again, this is the generic one. So back to the bottom again for just a moment. People and learning, uh, the right people doing the right stuff with the right training and the right culture to drive uh, process excellence in those those key processes that we need to excel at to drive uh, customer value, which then provides us the financial returns on the top line um, and on the bottom line. 
that is at the core the very basic breakdown of the balanced part of the balanced scorecard and those four different perspectives, financial, customer, internal processes or process excellence, and people and learning. Let's look at this a little bit in a little bit more detail then. Starting from the top, um, instead of from the bottom, we have two things we need to do as a for-profit organization. Nonprofit will look a little different, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Uh, we need to, of course, generate revenue, and we need to be profitable, so top line and bottom line. The way in which we do that, of course, and I mentioned this, but this breaks it down a little bit further, is um, acquire new customers, keep our current customers, and service the ones that we have in order to generate uh, the revenue that we are seeking as an organization. Um, in order to acquire those customers and keep them, those are some of the processes that I just mentioned uh, need to be in place that help us drive the profitability of our organization, and those really do drive um, the margin component uh, of the business. And one thing that I didn't mention previously, but that is often included in the process excellence is the regulatory uh, and risk uh, processes. So uh, some, some, different, some different looks at the different processes we need to excel at. And then again, um, all of this rises and falls on the people component of our organization. So sometimes I've been asked, and um, I, you probably have been too if you've worked with this quite a bit, is why, are the, why is the people component on the bottom? People should be first. And I think it's important to note that these are, at least this is how I explain it, they're building blocks. And if the base of the, of the building blocks fall apart then, or, or aren't there, then everything else sort of falls apart. Um, another I've often heard, and, and again, you know, we could, we could take this for what it's worth, uh, why is it uh, moving upward like this? Why not make it a circle? It is sort of circular. That is true. You could talk about this from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top. Um, so there's all kinds of different ways to break it down and think about it depending upon um, how you think, you know, how your brain and thinking style works, how your um, staff thinking style works. Um, but I think what's important to note is these are the basic perspectives that make up a balanced strategy. And no matter how you mix and match them, we're asking not to look at a strategy by an organizational chart. We're asking to look at our strategy based on a balanced organization uh, and looking at it holistically. And I think that's really the key. One of the coolest and the key takeaway uh, pieces about the balanced scorecard. This is getting a little bit more detailed, so just breaking it further down, and this is just a generic strategy map. And I'm using the word strategy map now then just to say that the strategy map is a visual representation of the balance component of your strategy. It is, it, it's just a, a, a visual view, and it really helps tell the strategy story, and it really helps um, when you map this out to see if your um, strategy is in indeed balanced. So you can see um, these items that we've already discussed, but this is just in a little bit more detail. Again, we'll be providing these slides um, emailed to you um, this week, as we always do, so we wanted to provide this to you as a, a future reference point. Let's look at some examples. Um, and, and still sticking with the balance part of the balance scorecard, um, this is a for-profit example, and this is a strategy map uh, that we put together for our client. So I think what's important about this is people always ask me what should be mapped on the strategy map. And my answer right is always we need to map what will best communicate the strategy and show that we've created a holistic and balanced strategy. So what's on here is not all of the top-level statements, and let's just use the word goal for now, uh, but just the key initiatives. And the reason that the CEO wanted to see it this way um, is because he didn't want to see all of, the, all of the big rocks, if you will, for the next five years. He wanted to see the big rocks for the next year. Well, you could argue that's not strategic enough. It sort of depends on the pace of your organization. That's fine. Um, but this is what he had asked for, and this is how he wanted to communicate his strategy, and this is how he was thinking about communicating a holistic, balanced, non-siloed approach to his, his uh, strategic plan. So um, at the top, we've got profitability improvement. You can see the statements in there. A lot of focus on new customer conversions. Um, there was a focus on sales and marketing, innovation, process excellence, and then culture uh, and innovation. So a culture of innovation, so you, you can kind of see that there are some statements that are listed there as well. So the statements in these boxes here are their annual goal statements uh, without uh, the targets, actually. So that's maybe one way to actually map your strategy and show the balanced component of, the balance, of, of your balanced uh, scorecard. Moving on a bit more quickly, and I'm not going to go through these in detail. I just wanted to show maybe some totally different examples. This may look a little bit... Um, 
I don't know, uh, childish might be a, a way to look at it or a way to say it. Um, but what we wanted to communicate in this particular, this is a government example, is the simplicity of, of this particular city's uh, strategy, and and this, these were the the key. These were the these were five. These are five year statements. So these are the big long term statements, and in in their uh, parlance, they are strategic goals. Five year statements, um, and you can kind of see this is a slightly different way to look at the perspectives of the balanced scorecard. This is from a government um, from a government uh, viewpoint, looking at financial accountability. That's the financial component. Community well being. Um, is really that customer component. Public safety and service and citizen engagement is really the process component. And then organizational excellence is what they call their people component. So that's how they articulated the balanced uh, approach to their strategy. And here's a second government example. And I, we share these examples because we're approved to do so. And the more we have approval to do, we will, uh, we will share more. And this is a different look at the strategy map. Uh, you can see that they wanted to articulate uh, they wanted to articulate it slightly differently. The top perspective is the stakeholders and outcomes that they're deriving for their stakeholders, not necessarily financial. And so, of course, from a for-profit perspective, financial outcome is the outcome we're seeking for our stakeholders. In this particular example, it's a it's a it's an office within a state government uh, entity for North Dakota, um, and the stakeholders are. Um, uh, we're at the, for them at the top, and their stakeholders, who they serve are state agencies, and so that's where, um, that's how they want to communicate uh, what they're trying to seek as a, uh, as an entity. And then you can see what we did is we mapped the five-year statements, um, and in their uh, language, for their strategic initiatives, those are the ones in green, and then we also mapped the annual goals in, in yellow. So it looks a little bit different, and this is how they wanted to communicate their strategy. So again, a couple things happening here. Um, this is a, showing the balance, showing the cause and effect relationship, um, and then also thinking about what is it that we're showing in this visual representation. In this case, we're, we're showing five-year and one-year statements. In some of the other cases, you saw that I showed a five-year statement, and the for-profit one, I sh we showed one-year statements. So just different ways to think about it, and I would argue that there's no right way to do it. Uh, it just matters what works for you. So moving along, that was the balance component. Let's look at the scorecard component of the balance scorecard. Um, Going from strategy map to scorecard, I particularly like this illustration, although I, I know from using it in the past it, it works for some folks and for others it doesn't. So if this doesn't work for you, just ignore it. Um, it's super linear. So it, it very much from the left-hand side goes from the strategy map, taking taking the, the high-level statements that we just articulated in a balanced way and then turning and then and cascading those and moving those into in this case, annual objectives, and then measures and targets associated with those objectives, and those measures and targets are what make up the balance, the scorecard comp component, and we've already balanced because we created the balance piece first. And then the department plan is just how that might cascade then further uh, into the organization. So just wanted to show how we go from balanced, which is, the, is shown in a strategy map, and we Sometimes we map our annual statements, as noted before, sometimes we don't, but then, of course, each of our annual statements have measures and targets associated with them, and that, of course, is the scorecard component of our balanced scorecard. So, again, this visual may work for you, and it may not. Um, this is purposely has a big black box over it. This is a real scorecard we put together for an organization. Um, and what I wanted to show here is, and this is just from my own, you know, personal research, when researching around, I say, what the heck, let's make sure that, you know, what, when we talk about a scorecard, what is the actual template that people are thinking about? And this is the template that people are thinking about. So it is the balance component, which we have our balance pieces over on the left-hand side. We've got our, state, our annual statements, our measures, and our targets. So, you know, spreadsheet um, is simply as clear and articulated as this. So just wanted to, to show you that. A couple ideas here, and I see that we're having that's a little bit of overlay with my uh, with my sticky note there, but just some thoughts on developing effective measures. Um, I think you know obviously it's really easy to say oh just develop measures and targets for your um, your annual statements, and we all know that the the devil's in the details on that. It's not always that easy. Um, so just kind of some ideas. Is, number one is you know it's suppo they're supposed to what this says is. It's supposed to, our measures are supposed to provide a way to see if our strategy is working. So 
you know, one example from some of the, someone that we worked with is um, in most organizations that put this in place for the first time, within three years, 75% of your measures will have changed to something else. So we need to get started with something um, and, and, um, and, and, and start working with those measures. And if those measures aren't telling us how our, if our strategy is working or not, then we need to modify the measures to, to, to see if they are. Um, so I think that's just a really important point and give ourselves grace around that. Um, the second point on there says that we want to, of course, focus our employees and managers and our senior team on what matters most to success. That is the point. Um, it should be empowering to the team, and it should explain the outcomes we're seeking. I think that's such an important point, is that the measures and targets should express the outcome we are seeking from the action we are taking, either articulated in the objective or goal statement, whatever words you're using. So what are we trying to see differently in the organization, and how are we tracking that difference? So a couple things here. Um, measures need to have defined ownership. Uh, it's really hard when it's shared ownership, so just kind of a note on that. Uh, we do need a, you need a precise unit of measure, and ideally the frequency of all of your measures would be you know, somewhat the same. That would make life easier. So if they're monthly, they're monthly. If they're quarterly, they're quarterly. If they're weekly, they're weekly. Um, and it, we also need to be clear about the frequency of that data collection. And not all data can actually, uh, of course, we know be collected on a monthly or, or, or a quarterly basis, so we just kind of need to be Think about that uh, as we're looking at our measures. Moving a little bit along, some types of measures. There's quantitative measures, there's practical measures, and there's directional indicators. Um, so I'll just leave that there to say these are just different types. You know, a percentage, progress, um, and then, you know, how are we doing last month to this month? So pretty pretty basic, and I'm just going to move along a little bit quickly here, but that's there for your reference in the future as well to think about what types of measures are we employing. So then let's just put all the pieces together of uh, the balance scorecard. So we've got our strategy map, which is the visual representation of the balance component of our strategy. We've got our scorecard, which is the, helps us track our progress of our strategy or of our objective month by month or quarter by quarter, depending upon what you're doing. And then, of course, what we didn't talk about, but I just want to throw this out there, is the word dashboard, which, of course, is the visual representation of your scorecard. And there are operational dashboards or strategy dashboards. It gets used all the time. I think it's really easy to just right now decide dashboards or dashboards, um, and they are visual representation of a scorecard. Okay. So uh, with that, I know that I, we're getting a little bit short on time because I, I want to make sure that we get to our other two topics. Um, love it if you could just pop some of the examples that you have of putting the balance scorecard uh, to use in your organization um, into the chat box, and we'll come back to them um, at the end of today's session. So here's some summary actions and some takeaways. Um, you can see them there, laying out your existing goals and objectives in the strategy map, uh, establishing corporate measures, determine the responsibility for data gathering, um, and give yourself, the, give yourself the grace to revise the measures if they're not helping you see your strategy. So with that, that was a big topic. Um, Cami, do you have anything to add on on the balance scorecard that, that I didn't that I didn't touch on? Oh. Let's see here. And now Cami's here. Cami, can you hear us? Maybe you're, you're still muted if you're on your side talking. Okay. Looks like we're having a little bit of a challenge here. And um, give us just a minute here. Alrighty, so it looks like Cammy's having some technical difficulties this morning as well. Um, let's just keep on um, uh, moving along. And uh, the next question, the next topic that we wanted to we wanted to address is uh, running strategy reviews and, and how do I run an effective an effective strategy review is one of the questions that our that our uh, participants asked last month, I believe. Um, so, and we're hoping that Cammy's going to jump right back in as soon as she as soon as she uh, gets back on here. So. Um, you know, it's, it's of course the, um, Cammy, are you there? Oh, let me really 
apologize, everyone. Give us just a minute here. Cammy. Cammy, can you hear us? Okay. So, um, Since it's April 1st, um, and then we're the, at the end of it, <laughs> it's, it's April 1st? Tomorrow. All right. Uh, it's April 1st. Um, so tomorrow's April 1st. Um, we will be, you will probably be running a quarterly uh, session, maybe coming up, uh, if that's something that is you're planning on doing in your organization, something we would certainly uh, recommend. Um, a lot of people ask, well, how can I actually run a strategy review more effectively? And uh, there's a couple different ways to go about this. I don't think that there's any right way or wrong way, um, but maybe some things to think about as a strategy leader in your organization, how uh, you might drive the review process uh, into, your, um, into your existing business processes if you haven't already, or if you're already doing this, how might you do it better? So we're going to actually walk through uh, just a couple of options, um, some different ways that you might think about um, structuring your strategy review process. So there's a quarterly strategy review process and a, subject, a suggestion around that, and there's a monthly strategy review process and, a, and a, a suggestion around that. So those are the kind of the two things we're going to walk through here. Um, as just a really important point that I want to I want to make is um, take this for what it is, um, adapt it as as you may see fit. Uh, make your own modifications to fit your organization because at the end of the day, uh, this particular moving from a strategic plan into the execution process and reviewing the strategy on a regular basis, we find as the hardest sort of uphill battle uh, that most organizations and most strategy leaders face, just getting the adoption of this um, uh, and the rigor around the strategy review process in your organization. Um, it takes it sort of takes getting over that hump and building that competency. So I just would recommend that if you're walking down this path, commit to it for six months. Get your senior team, get your folks um, comfortable with um, running strategy reviews and when the purpose of a strategy review um, before you decide if you need to change it or if it's not working. So, okay, doke. So option one, strategy review. Um, point here, of course, is not to mix up strategy and operations. We understand there's overlap. Um, it is, it, there's definitely a Venn diagram there where the strategy and review, or strategy and operations cross over, but we're asking to, 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 to and it suggests that you keep them separate. Um, obviously, you have key performance indicators that are operationally specific, and you have strategy um, uh, scorecards uh, that are strategy specific. And so, perhaps, if you're doing it on a quarterly basis, on uh, month one and month two of your quarter uh, would be operational reviews that occur uh, normally at a department letter level and then, of course, up at the senior team level where you're actually dealing with operational type issues. Um, on month three is when you would actually use that regularly scheduled meeting to do a strategy review where you're actually working and talking with the whole senior team. You're talking about the key performance indicators that are on your corporate scorecard that talk about the progress of your strategy. It is possible, and it does happen, that some of those measures uh, may actually be those same operational measures you talked about in month two and month one. But the point around the strategy review is to say we are specifically carving out time to talk about the corporate objectives or the corporate goals that are strategic, that are driving our organizational forward, organizational forward in a transformational way, the big stuff. Um, the way, of course, all that happens, it drives itself into operations, and we totally understand that. Um, also, part of that strategy review um, is to say and to note that we're talking about strategic issues. So, for example, maybe that strategy stat uh, of of the government, you know, government being maybe more involved in your industry, that would perhaps be a strategic issue that you might want to take um, at your uh, at your strategy review session to talk about what is the big picture implications of you know X Y Z. Um, XYZ bill or XYZ legislation, et cetera. So that's kind of the, the point in the nuts and bolts of, of, of operations versus strategy. Option one, as we're talking about here, looking and having that conversation on a quarterly basis. I'm not going to go through this in detail, uh, but this is sort of the who's supposed to do what and when in order to prepare for that strategy review on a quarterly basis. 
uh, you can see here, and we've used this before, so you may have seen this before, but I just think it's so important because most people want to know what am I supposed to do and how much time is it going to take. Um, so and we've got green dots indicate strategy development and red dots are strategy execution. So, you know, on an annual basis, we update our strategy, which drives into month one. Um, we're having our operational discussions in month one and month two. And then month three, we're having that quarterly um, strategic uh, strategy review session. And we're actually preparing issues in order to uh, – in order to – to talk about those at, in, a, in a meaningful way on that in that month's recession, and perhaps you also have to report to the board. And if you have a board to report to, doing that on a quarterly basis after your quarterly strategy review would be a, would be a good idea. Any changes to the strategy, and this is the adaption component. Any changes to the strategy, of course, would drive into your month four department review uh, discussions, and that's what that box is intended to say. All right. Another way to go about it is if you're in an organization and in, 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 in an industry where there's more flux and we need to be looking at the strategy in a more frequent basis, uh, perhaps consider breaking that, uh, looking at your strategy monthly and breaking the discussion uh, into the first component is an operational view and the second component is a strategy review. Now, this says AM and PM, but maybe it's two hours operations, two hours strategy, um, you know, whatever the break, breakdown might be. So again, the point here is that we're being clear about talking about operations, and then we're talking about um, strategy. And again, that whole idea, and I think this is a really important one, and it takes rigor, is to say we've identified strategic issues in advance, perhaps they came out of the last month's strategy review session, that we, we, we want to discuss in a meaningful way. We've prepped them, we've come prepared with information, we're going to talk about it, we're going to make a decision, and we're going to adapt the strategy accordingly. This, of course, is our strategy review in detail. Um, so, again, very similar to the previous example, and this is just broken down by month instead of uh, by quarter and who needs to do what by when. We need that information to roll up on a, on a, a periodic basis in order to have that monthly meeting um, be effective. So, of course, we need to know from our team members um, how they're doing against their goals. The departments need to update their information. And that should, of course, have be a discussion at the, at the department level about about the strategy, and then that would roll up to the senior level. So just a pretty uh, simple little flow, what might need to happen in week one, week two, and then in order for week three to be effective and to have that strategy review on a monthly basis and not to be um, – you know, two um, rose-colored glasses about this. This does take some organizational adoption. Um, it is important to it's important to understand. It's important for all of us to acknowledge that this takes some time and it takes commitment and it takes leadership to commit to wanting to see this happen. So, um, shouldn't take too much time when we're doing this on a monthly basis for each person to update their information about how they're doing against their goals. But it does require commitment to that. So, here's just a quick little. Strategy session agenda. Um, this is a, it's a basic agenda adopted as you see fit. I won't go through all the details, but just um, noting quickly. And actually, this should actually say um, this should actually say uh, strategy leader. Uh, we should, of course, clarify the agenda. Go over the corporate status uh, and the KPIs at, at the at the corporate level, and then go over the department status, discuss strategic issues, and then, of course, review. So this is an agenda at the, could it be at the department level. It could also be the same agenda at the senior level. All right. I think this is kind of an interesting thing as well, and we just wanted to share this because, really, it's about the discussion that we're having at these strategy reviews that make them so important. And... And we've talked about this maybe before, and I'd just like to share it again, is, is the definition and, and, it'd be, um, and the difference between discussion and dialogue. So um, discussion is – or dialogue is defined as a conversation that is um, generally related to brainstorming to gain more insight about a topic. And discussion is defined as a conversation that is driving towards a decision. So – 
we should talk, we should clarify when we're having a strategy review session, are we dialoguing or are we discussing and but not getting wrapped around the asshole about the different definitions, but are we trying to make a decision or are we just having a conversation? Um, do we have the information to make the decision today or do we need to table it until the next strategy review session? And I think that's, that's such an important piece to having an effective conversation um, during our strategy reviews. So some summary actions. If this is something that you're working on and, and if you if you've got a strategic plan in place, it'd be fabulous to fabulous to, to think about how we drive the review process into the organization. Pick an option or, or a combination of options that work for you that I just went through previously. Do we want to do it on a monthly or on a quarterly basis? Review our strategy. Schedule those reviews and, and commit to it. Draft that agenda so we give you a draft example. I think it's important as, as a strategy leader, and everybody on the phone is a strategy leader, um, is to make sure that people understand what they need to come into the meeting prepared for. And that kind of goes without saying, but it seems like oftentimes we're not really clear about what information needs to be prepared and what reports we need to have uh, in, ready in order to um, actually have an effective conversation. So it's important to clarify what those data points would be. And then I just love this last piece here, and that is, you know, it's, we're trying to actually have an effective and exciting conversation, not just another meeting. Um, and I just, you know, the Death by Meeting book by Patrick Lecioni is a perfect example of that. So we want to make sure that the, that the strategy review session um, is exciting and really the outcome, and you can see that on the slide there, the outcome of the session um, is really to keep your plan relevant and alive. That's the point. Um, and it's not just to be a report out. And I just would really urge us not to. Uh, not to just report out. Um, so, just some summary actions there on how you might bring the strategy review process into your organization. So, um, I really, we really just want to apologize for not uh, being able to deal with some technical issues today, and I, we're not really sure what the heck's going on. But we're going to try to pipe Daryl in here and see if see if we can hear him. So let's let's try this again. Um, Daryl, are can you with you us? Me? We can hear you. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, that's yes. great. Oh, fantastic. Well, this is Daryl from uh, Iowa. And uh, picking up on what has been said, let's talk about a Government Plus in terms of their support of strategic planning. Uh, we're, this will be a rather unique approach, and it involves a major project as a part of a formal organization that the government uh, has provided us a $1 million grant to, uh, in effect, uh, strengthen training and technical assistance and sub-grant awards uh, to under-resourced areas of the country. And so uh, our uh, organization is the Iowa Center for Faith-Based and Community Initiatives that submitted a proposal to the government to the Department of Health and Human Services, get this, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, Strengthening Communities Fund, that's where the fund is, and the specific program within that fund is the Nonprofit Capacity Building Pro Program. And they emphasize the importance of nonprofits throughout the country who pick up most of the care to under-resourced persons, and their gamble is if we can find intermediary organizations throughout the country, and they picked 34, of which the Iowa Center is one, and we can have the intermediary organization provide training, technical assistance, and subgrant awards to worthy grassroots nonprofit, small nonprofit organizations. Uh, in their um, in their locales, that we can serve the underserved uh, even better, and more of them. And so we have a two-year grant uh, to be formed into two cycles. The first starting in April and going through December of 2010, and the second cycle starting in January and going to September of 2011. So within a, a nine-month uh, time period, we must deliver, uh, again, training and technical assistance and grant uh, awards 
to perhaps up to 30 plus organizations that have been uh, identified through a competitive process and uh, uh, make them into a, a greater uh, capacity uh, building organization than they were when they started. So um, what we have done in our proposal is describe the M3 planning process. In the appendix, we've uh, included uh, MP planning uh, paper materials so they could get a good sense of what we have to do and uh, uh, have to offer. Uh, I think the feds were impressed with the uh, capacity for training and also distance learning. And so this is what, what we'll be doing. Starting in on April the 7th and going to April the 21st and also May the 5th, we will be uh, bringing all of these first level cycle organizations, about 17 of them, their team members, uh, to a central source. And part of the session, the day-long session, will be three uh, presentations and then breakout sessions. We'll start with mission. And each of them has already provided a proposal that lists out their current mission statement. And so we will uh, encourage them to take another look at their mission statement. So the first part of a session will be about a five-minute little presentation of the three bullet point questions of a mission statement, what it is, and our leader will uh, further maybe enhance those just a bit, but then they'll break out for about 45 minutes of discussion and work on a preliminary basis of their, of their mission statement. Uh, and this will be then they will operate off of a paper uh, packet in which the box, you know, is for them to start to uh, draft out uh, their mission statement if they don't have one. But most of them have a mission statement. This will be a time to enhance their mission statement based upon some of the examples that they can be that can be found in the guide, uh, the practical guide to nonprofit uh, uh, strategic planning. Hey, Daryl, uh, this is Eric. Yeah. Sure, will you share with us maybe as, as your as is perfect segue here some of the challenges uh, and opportunities that you are seeing that your the organizations you're helping um, are experiencing in today's uh, economic. Uh, climate and, and what some of the, yeah some of the strategic challenges or opportunities that they're facing just as the sort of nonprofits in general. Yes, we had a test run in 2007 using uh, M3 planning uh, with four organizations, and as the organ as the proposals come in, uh, strategic planning is right up on on top of the uh, the platter, as is volunteerism. Uh, because of a need to stretch their resources, uh, they can't afford new staff, so they, they need the resources of volunteerism. Uh, we, of course, uh, are going into the southeast part of the state of Iowa with the highest unemployment and um, uh, economic indicators. And so uh, each of them is fi uh, are finding uh, people coming to them with uh, just a host of uh, uh, of problems, most of them economic, and so a part of this grant too will be uh, helping them plan how they uh, are will address the economic, the employment assistance and benefits uh, needs of their clients. This is capacity building. It's uh, it's not service delivery. So it's building up the muscles of the organization to address these issues, as, as you have uh, uh, asked me to, to talk. Absolutely. Absolutely. And maybe, Daryl, if you could just uh, summarize for us kind of from your perspective, maybe, um, you know, a couple of key takeaways or key actions for the other folks that are on the call today. If they're a nonprofit, what, um, what they, from your perspective, um, what are the best practices they should be employing in capacity building um, 
as they're putting their strategic plans together? What's, what would you what would you tell them? Well, uh, I think our approach is pretty uh, 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 across the board type of thing, where you uh, get groups together, uh, the teams together to strategize their mission, their vision, their uh, values, and uh, their SWATs, for example, and uh, play around with this, and then uh, and then place it into their M3 planning system so that it can be reviewed across the organization. Uh, we have uh, uh, seven staff members working with us so that they can then review uh, the progress of their strategic planning as they put into it the various aspects of what the nine months will, will mean to, to their uh, organization and how they will spend their money. They, we're giving each about up to $20,000 to be spent within the nine-month period to, to do uh, bring in consultants, to go travel to conferences and all that. And so it's a great way to monitor what's going on within the organization. Okay. And so it's, it's a combination of on-site and off-site, on-site training, off-site technical assistance. Gotcha. You know, I think it's um, super exciting uh, what Daryl is doing to, to sort of mass impact um, nonprofit organizations across uh, across the state of Iowa. And I want to just um, say that we, you know, we, we, of course, all the strategy leaders on the phone today believe so strongly in the impact that strategic planning can have on um, an organization and how much more effective that folks can be um, in their resources that they have generated or they have been granted. And um, Daryl's mass application of the strategic planning process um, to, it sounds like, uh, almost 30 uh, different nonprofits is, is something that he's been using our tools to help deploy, but his staff um, as, the, as the consultants and as the coaches uh, to help these organizations be more successful. And I just want to put out there, Daryl, we'd like you to have you come back in, you know, six months or eight months to, to report back on how, you know, how is it going? How are these organizations doing? Are they making the progress that we think they should be making by deploying the strategic planning process in their organization? I think Absolutely. That would be really We're being evaluated. Our, our external evaluators from the University of Iowa is interested in the same thing. Okay. And the government is very interested in technical assistance, which online coaching through M3 planning is ideal. All right. Well, that's awesome. Um, Daryl, I want to thank you for uh, joining us and, and sharing, and we'll have Daryl back to, to, to report on the results because, you know, it's all about the results. And, um, and it's just kind of to share as well if you're a strategy leader on the phone today that you'd like to share what's going on in your organization uh, or maybe use something similar going on where you're impacting um, a, a bunch of different groups such as Daryl, we'd love to have you share. So please let us know. Send us an email. We'd love to have you on. Um, I think we've actually f solved one of our technical challenges here, and I'm going to try this again. Um, Cammy, can can you can we hear you? I hope you can hear me. All right, Cammy. Hi. Hi. Uh, would you like to summarize um, some points that you heard today, uh, either from the strategy review or the balance scorecard that you'd like to share sure. in your work with clients? Yeah, I think that um, I have a, a Leroy Jenkins, Jenkins hair moment, if anyone um, knows any. The viral video, the top viral videos, but uh, he'll be laughing if, with that example. But I'm glad to be um, here, and I just wanted to chat with Erica's review of those, um, the great review of the balance scorecard. Um, there's just a couple things I, I think that could be added on to that that those peers offer a really good guidance on perhaps selecting your key performance indicators. And, and that way, when those indicators come in, you're not just looking at um, your profit. You're just not looking at your processes. You're looking at the organization as a whole. So if you need some guidance in picking those goals that should be your key performance indicators, perhaps coming to the balance scorecard is a good place to start. Um, and also that the balance scorecard is a great visual from a communications perspective, internally and externally. It's a great way to make sure um, that everyone stays on the same page and that the community is, um, or your key stakeholders, are aware of your intent and your direction. And, um, and it just makes for a more cohesive direction for your company when all those things are aligned. So I, I definitely wanted to, um, that was what I wanted to comment with Erica's portion of the presentation. And thank you so much for going through 
on what we needed to go through with the um, strategy review sessions. You did a great job, and I just want to add some, some value-added stats to that. Um, and then if there's any other questions, we'll go ahead and, and turn it back to um, the group. But there was a study that was done on um, the obstacles to strategic execution by Wharton School of Business. It was published in 2002, and it was based on a 20-year um, uh, collection of data. Um, two out of the top five obstacles to, to, to strategic education, tongue tied there, is that um, one of them is poor or inadequate information sharing between individuals or business units that are responsible for strategy execution. Through this presentation, through strategy reviews, we hope that you um, get a little bit of insight on how that's going to be addressed. And also the um, unclear communication responsibility and or accountability for execution decisions or actions. That, again, is um, should be something that is addressed during your strategy reviews. So those are two of the top five reasons, um, based on a 20-year study, that execution um, come into obstacles um, with, with, you know, your strategic plan. So um, consider the role of strategy reviews in being able to um, remedy those. And I just I appreciate the opportunity to get in here at the last minute and share those thoughts with you. And I just, Erica, I'll turn it right back to you for any um, follow-up thoughts, and, and hopefully we have um, a few feedback, uh, you know, chats from the from the crowd here. Thanks, Cami, and thanks everybody again too. As Ryan noted at the beginning, this is obviously not rehearsed, so we were trying to pull in a bunch of different ideas and a bunch of different um, different technology to have a, a full and interesting conversation. So, um, as Cami mentioned, we'd love to hear your feedback, or if you would like to share on either the balance scorecard or on strategy reviews. Um, let's kind of look at the. Next huddle information, we'll have our next huddle on April 28th. We really uh, would love to share and discuss things that are on your mind to help you run your organization in the strategic planning process as effectively as possible. That's really what it's all about. Um, share them now. Um, send them to admin at mystrategicplan.com. If you would like to present or share best practices that are working for you or or maybe, um, you know, kind of in the spirit of things that not all practices are best, so maybe there's something that you did that, really flocked and uh, you'd like to make sure that nobody else has that experience and if you're brave and willing we'd love to we'd love to have you share so um, please just let us know send us an email give us a call and we're also trying to send out what we're hearing uh, in the cyberspace if you will about strategy and execution so follow us on Twitter if, if that's something that you uh, care to do and then of course we'll be sending out a recording uh, to this uh, to this webinar, as well as a link to the slides, the PDF slides, so you could have them for your reference. So uh, with that in mind, um, really appreciate everybody's time. We're at the top of the hour. Uh, we'll share everyone's feedback and thoughts of the next strategy huddle, and thank you again for sticking with us on this one, and we look forward to seeing everybody back here uh, on April 28th. Daryl, Cammie, Ryan, thank you very much, and everybody have a great week. Take care.